Good afternoon, and welcome to the Voices and Leadership series as we open our spring season. This series focuses on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in the world of public health. I am Betty Johnson, and I have the privilege to direct this program and to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Niels Delore is a multifaceted leader, a national and political world expert in child health and survival, especially in the areas of community-based management of childhood pneumonia and vitamin A supplementation. Dr. Delure served in the Obama administration as Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs at the Department of Health and Human Services and as the United States Representative on the Executive Board of the World Health Organization. As the U.S. government's top international health expert, Dr. Delure speaks seven languages which no doubt came in handy when he led U.S. negotiations on health at the Cairo International Conference on Women, the Rome World Food Summit in 1996, the Beijing uh, Conference, as I've said, on women, and at five national annual assemblies at the WHO. President and CEO of the Global Health Council for 10 years, Dr. Delure led policy and advocacy efforts to improve maternal and child health, reproductive health and family planning, HIV, AIDS, and infectious disease control in the poorest populations around the world. In his efforts in field work, it led him to work in four dozen countries, including Nepal, Mali, Bangladesh, and Haiti. A member of the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine, Dr. Delure is a Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude graduate of Harvard College, Harvard Medical School, receiving his MD degree, and doing his residency training in family medicine at the University of Colorado. He received his master's in public health from Johns Hopkins University and is board certified in preventative medicine and public health. When Dr. Delure is not globetrotting around the world, he can be found enjoying his passion for Vermont farming. There he swaps policy and advocacy for the fine art of chainsawing, field mowing, and carpentry. He once was heard saying, and I quote, my obituary must include the words woods and power equipment, end quote. <laughs> when <laughs> we are delighted to have Dr. Delore as a Mitchell Fellow at this school this term. Before I turn this session over to Dr. Ashish Jha, T.K. Lai, Professor of International Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management and Director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, who will conduct today's interview. Please join me as we welcome Dr. Niels Delore to the Voices and Leadership Series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Right, well, Niels, thank you so much for being here. It is, uh, to say that it's an honor, I think would be an understatement. We're really grateful that you took the time to spend some time with us this afternoon. Delight. Um, so I want to start off by remarking on what I think is a remarkable moment in, in global health. This is a, a moment where uh, global health is the most popular secondary at Harvard College. It is a topic of intense interest at the medical school, the School of Public Health, really across the university. I'm wondering if you could start us off by talking to us about what is global health? Mm -hmm. And why does it create such passion? Why are students especially so interested in this topic right now? I think global health has really captured young people's imagination as well as some older people um, it, because it runs the entire gamut from uh, intense care for the individual to societal improvement. Uh, and I titled uh, the, this talk the Act Three because in my view, Act One of Global Health was really focused on the individual. It was saving lives and saving souls, uh, very often associated with, with uh, missionary medicine. Act Two, which went roughly from the middle of the 20th century until maybe 10 years ago, was mostly oriented towards building up societies and communities by improving their health. But it was also very much directed towards uh, them towards others. Act three, which we're really getting very deeply into right now, is about all of us. Uh, and it's very clear from the uh, development of global health over the past 10 years that this is a common endeavor and a common good. And I think all of these things appeal to young people. Uh, it's a chance to do something meaningful. 
uh, as I've seen, it's a chance to do something very exciting and, and uh, uh, quite remarkable in some instances, uh, and to make a difference that will hopefully reverberate through the next century. So that's very helpful, and, I, and that's a great um, transition. And I wonder if you could talk about this Act Three uh, a little bit more. And it seems to me like one of the th ways that we can see this transition is talking about international health mm -hmm. to talking about global health. Yeah. How do you see the difference between the two, and, and how do you think that sort of plays into the broader narrative of where global health is and where it's going? Yeah. Well, international health, as it was framed when I first got into the field of international health, yeah. um, uh, was really focused on doing good things for other countries or for people in other countries. Uh, and uh, it really was outward oriented, uh, very often related to um, dealing with individual countries and the problems that they had. Global health is much more holistic uh, and really requires looking at not only what the consequences are going to be for the immediate population that you're aiming at, uh, but how that's going to affect the rest of the global fabric. We've seen since the 1980s, this enormous explosion in globalization, global trade, global movement, global population movement, um, and also global spread of disease. And um, in that context, unless we look at things really from a global, from a world perspective, we're going to miss important pieces of the puzzle. And in your mind, the Ebola outbreak of last year, and it still isn't completely gone, but thankfully mm -hmm. mostly, what we're seeing with the Zika virus right now. Um, does this sort of reinforce that worldview? Do you feel like this sort of helps you? Under, does the global health framework help you better understand what's happening with these viruses? Oh, absolutely. And not only helps us understand better, it also helps us to respond better. Hmm. Uh, because I think when we were dealing with international health or earlier with tropical medicine, yeah. um, these things would have been addressed in a particular location, uh, and uh, very often uh, by imposing restrictions on movement and trade and so forth, uh, which are simply not realistic in today's world. And so what the global perspective does is it forces a look at not only what's happening in Sierra Leone, uh, but what might happen in, say, Dallas. Um, and unless we're keenly aware of that, and as we're seeing now with the Zika virus, the potential uh, for spread within the United States, um, we have to be very engaged outside the United States uh, to protect our own people. But we also have to learn from what others are doing and what we're doing outside the US to do better work here in the US. Hmm. So really flips the notion of global health as something that's external um, to something that is very much as much about us as it is about everybody no, else. No, that's exactly right. It's no longer primarily an aid and humanitarian concern. Uh, it is a common endeavor. Yeah. Uh, one more kind of big picture theme, and, and really I want to talk about the flip side of this, which is, and to see if you see it as the flip side, which is while we have all of this passion and interest in global health, We've also seen a strand of um, sort of anti-immigration sentiments build really tall walls. Um, you know, the push to shut down flights uh, into West Africa when the Ebola outbreak. Do you see the sort of anti-immigration, the, um, and some people have talked about terrorism as sort of under the same, do you, do you see it as sort of connected to this broader globalization or, or do you see these as, as relatively separate issues? No, I think they're very much two sides of the same coin. Um, on the one side, the things that you're describing are the things that engender fear of connection with the other. Um, and uh, on the side that I've been working on is the opportunity. Uh, opportunities to do better both at home and internationally and to recognize that there is no wall high enough to keep out uh, mosquitoes carrying Zika virus or dengue or malaria or whatever, uh, unless we are dealing with these uh, issues on a global basis, uh, we will very certainly be dealing with them here at home. And so I, I think the, the, the fear is understandable. The world is changing rapidly. And uh, it's, you, you think back to a simpler time when these things didn't happen. Of course, we had cholera epidemics in the United States that came on slow ships 
uh, but it didn't happen with the speed and the intensity and the media coverage yeah. uh, that it's happening today. So I think people are frightened for that reason. And so what does this mean in terms of now, you were obviously at HHS and you thought about the kind of health agenda, but think more broadly from a U.S. government perspective. Um, issues around diplomacy, issues around trade, and I'm gonna get a little bit into kind of your tenure at, at HHS in a second. But do you think this changes the posture that the, that the government should take on a whole variety of issues? Um, how, how does this connect to the broader global agenda? Not the global health agenda, but yeah. the broader global yeah. agenda of the United States. Well, I, I think we're going to be going through a period, a decade or more, of a very profound transition in terms of the way we deal with major policy issues, uh, because increasingly, the things that are of concern here in the United States that affect Americans um, are things that are bigger than just America. They're taking place around the world that we uh, have enormous influence on, but that we cannot control domestically, uh, yeah. whether that is environment and uh, CO2 emissions and, and global warming, uh, whether it's uh, international terrorism uh, or uh, the rise of uh, groups who feel dispossessed. Uh, we've seen it uh, uh, recently in, in uh, uh, the West with this group that took over the, the, the Wildlife Center, uh, and uh, we see it in ISIS. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, the fact of feeling outside and left out uh, is one that's a global process uh, and one that we have to deal with on a global basis uh, because we can neither export our problems nor import the answers uh, without uh, really fully engaging. That's a that's very helpful framework. I now want to kind of dive into your time at HHS. Mm -hmm. um, you were the Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs and really a person who was, as Betty said, uh, our point person for global health. Um, you were obviously very well prepared given your background and expertise. And yet, I bet there were still some surprises, things that when you walked into that job, you weren't quite expecting. Um, would you share a few of those, a few things that you weren't expecting, a few challenges that you didn't quite see coming, and, uh, and then how you dealt with it? Well, I don't, first of all, I don't think you're ever well prepared. Um, okay. The best you can hope for is not to be so shocked that you can't act. Um, and uh, you know, I think, I think what experience is good for is uh, making lots of mistakes so you don't hopefully make them again. Uh, in fact, I've heard a great quote that experience is what you get just after you needed it. Uh, so so having, having had experience from things that I should have known better than years ago, I was able to make fewer mistakes now. But you, know, you make your mistakes and you move on. Yep. Um, certainly, uh, one of the things that struck me that was uh, not something I'd expected was the degree to which I had to deal with parts of the U.S. government, parts of, of uh, the way we deal with the world uh, that are entirely outside by traditional standards, the health arena. And uh, uh, one example, and probably the most uh, uh, challenging example, uh, was dealing uh, over the course of quite a number of years with the office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Huh. Uh, because what became very clear is that as we go through our global transitions, uh, and particularly as non-communicable diseases, chronic diseases become a growing part of not only our domestic health care issues, but of the global health uh, issues, uh, it's very clear that commercial relationships, whether that's international tobacco companies, or processed foods, or a range of other things, um, have an, a very strong impact in terms of people's health. Uh, and in particular, I spent an awful lot of time uh, with my colleagues in HHS, um, Howard Coe among others, and uh, my colleagues across the government trying to have some small influence on the negotiations going on relating to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm. Because there was a very important issue uh, there from a public health, a global health standpoint, having to do with tobacco control. And uh, trying to separate out uh, the means that uh, international tobacco companies might have uh, 
to influence uh, national policies in Australia and other places where plain packaging rules had come in, using trade rules uh, to, to fight tobacco control, yep. which is entirely contrary to the principles of public health in this country, to public health in other countries, but were entirely consistent with trade rules. Um, and what I had to learn was how to learn their language. Um, I was going to ask you, so do you think, I mean, presumably the people at USTR are good people, they care about public health. Mm -hmm. Didn't, didn't they see this? No, and, and I mean, you're exactly right. They, they are good people. Um, they've grown up in, grown up in terms of their, their thinking and in, in terms of international trade. Uh, they understand the benefits of free and open markets. Um, but they don't really understand health as a component of that. Mm. Uh, and one of the things that we've been devoting a lot of time and attention to in the public health sphere particularly with non-communicable diseases, is um, this concept of health in all policies. Uh, the fact that you have to deal with health issues not just in the clinic, yep. uh, but in the way you build your cities, uh, in the way you deal with air pollution, in uh, the kinds of foods that are found on the shelves in inner cities. And uh, this concept of health in all policies has to carry through to the trade arena as well. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it, this was not always a very popular thing uh, in conversations with colleagues at the USTR, not because they don't like health, uh, yeah, yeah. but because it's a different thing. And uh, there is sort of a high uh, religion of free trade uh, that says if you start to pull any of these elements out, you're going to undermine the whole regime. Uh, I profoundly disagree with that. Uh, we pull things out of everything all the time. Uh, we have free speech in this country, but you can't yell fire in a crowded uh, theater. And yeah. uh, it's a slippery slope argument that that's right. allows and you not to act at all. That's right. And and I think the slippery slope uh, argument is one that we have to contest, but we have to contest it reasonably. Sure. Uh, and so this, I thought, was going to be a one-month conversation, and then uh, we'd get it resolved. It turned out to be a four-and-a-half-year conversation. Uh, but I would note that uh, uh, even though uh, we, we await uh, action on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, in the end, at the very end, uh, this clause was negotiated into the uh, partnership agreement uh, that tobacco companies could not use investor state mechanisms to sue national governments uh, because of mm. issues like uh, plain packaging. I think it's one of the most potentially important public health, global public health actions taken in the last 20 years. Yeah, no, that's, and so I was going to ask you, how did that turn out? It sounds like at the last minute, we made some real progress. No, that's right. Do you think it's a model, and again, I, I'm careful of the slippery slope thing, oh. and I won't now use that for everything, mm -hmm. but do you think it's a model for dealing with a few other select public health issues that do come up when we negotiate trade agreements? Well, I, I think it's very individual. I think yeah. you have to look at these as uh, individual case um, and you have to I, I'm, I've become far more sensitized to their concerns the the trade uh, people's concerns that a lot of things are used by countries um, not just other countries sometimes our own yeah. uh, as rules that really are intended to protect domestic industries and to impede trade uh, rather than rules that are really intended uh, to improve health or improve environment or improve labor standards. And I think all of those things have to now be part of a thoughtful discussion and each one is going to have to be taken apart and assessed. Wow. So, so no simple models no for No simple models. Uh, that's, uh, I'm afraid the, the rule of the world is that yeah. there are no simple models. Yeah. yeah. Well, the simple issues sounds like they, they, they get solved pretty quickly. Yeah. It's the hard ones that yeah. require engagement. Um, Talking about another complex issue, and I, I want to come back to something we talked about very briefly, um, if it's okay. And I want to, that's the Ebola outbreak, mm. because there are moments in global health that people think are potential game changers mm. that change how they they garner a certain amount of political energy, interest by the general public, and allow us to look afresh at a at a at a complicated mm. problem. And I think a lot of us have sort of thought Ebola was one of them. Mm. Um, how do you see the global response to Ebola? We know about the challenges facing the three countries that were most affected. Mm -hmm. How do you see the global response to Ebola, how the global community did? And I know we've talked about this a little bit from the various reports that have gone into this. What do you think are the big lessons that come out of that, not just for disease outbreaks, but for global health more broadly? Yeah. 
Well, I'm, it's sad to say, but I think the, uh, uh, the overall assessment in terms of the way we dealt with uh, Ebola, especially during the first six to nine months, um, would be at best a degrade. Um, uh, I think the subsequent response uh, probably improved to a C plus, B minus, uh, but uh, we're certainly nowhere near where I had hoped we would be. Yeah. Uh, and I think what this reflected was failures on so many different levels. Uh, there was a failure at the national level to be willing to see and accept and even to collect the information needed to identify what was going on. There was a failure at the international level, particularly a failure of governance where the concerns of the national uh, interests, the national governments not to get in the way of, of trade, not to have uh, uh, bad reputation for their countries, not to make the Ministry of Health look bad. Those overrode the bigger uh, considerations. Now, you know, everyone always works with inadequate information, and that's one of the challenges. We, we retrospect is terrific, yep. uh, but at the time it was hard to know whether it was really going down, as uh, we thought in the spring of 2014, or just catching its breath, which turns out to be the case before it really exploded. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have the, the mechanisms in place, and by we I mean the global community, yeah. uh, to identify what was going on, to really track this. Uh, I think the first failure was a failure to quickly get on top of uh, information collection uh, before response, just to know what was going on. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the key lessons learned. But I think as this exploded, um, there was a failure to listen to some with real on-the-ground expertise, uh, MSF uh, in, in particular, who yep. raised the alarm about this months before the international community responded. Um, and at last, uh, a fully mobilized uh, international response. Now, that's the downside. Uh, the plus side is that, first of all, uh, I think this really was a wake-up call. Uh, for the World Health Organization, uh, for the international community, for the United States as well, um, and uh, underlined the vital importance of uh, what we now call global health security, which mm. is bigger than Ebola. It's the, uh, the, the mechanisms by which we would identify, uh, hopefully prevent, and then respond to serious uh, outbreaks anywhere in the world. Um, and this gave a real impetus uh, to these efforts, which uh, is sorely needed. So uh, again, I, I wouldn't be in this field if I didn't feel that my glass was always at least half full. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that we have learned a lot from this. Um, I am hopeful that some of the important structural changes at the World Health Organization uh, will take place. Uh, but I, I know for a fact uh, that there have been some very important developments within the United States. Uh, the launching of the global health security agenda and uh, the very significant funding that Congress provided at a time when they didn't want to fund very many things yep. uh, for, for not only the Ebola response but to build uh, a global network of uh, 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 prevention, uh, identification and, and response. And I think that's, that's a very positive move. Um, and just Building on that a little bit, um, you mentioned changes at the World Health Organization. Obviously, we, WHO is our lead agency for mm -hmm. kind of uh, international health issues. Um, in broad strokes, what do you think um, we need to do to make WHO more effective? Um, I'm, I'm saying that I may be too hard. I don't think we've got a week for this uh, <laughs> this conversation. Uh, I, I can give some very broad strokes. Very broad. Um, I, I think, first of all, uh, WHO continues to be a, uh, a mid-20th century institution. Uh, it was formed uh, at the end of World War II uh, in the context of uh, the bipoles of the United States and the USSR uh, with um, emerging uh, countries just coming onto the world scene, all kinds of things that needed to be done to rebuild after World War II. We're in a different place now, but WHO and the rest of the UN agencies um, are built for 1950. Mm. Uh, and um, I no longer use my parents' 1950 Chevrolet. Right. Um, and 
uh, I think we need to really look at restructuring, and by we, it's not the United States, it's the global community, at restructuring uh, WHO so that it can be uh, more responsive, so that it can be more focused, and so we don't ask it to do absolutely everything uh, about all kinds of problems, but say, what are the world's biggest challenges and threats in the health arena? What expertise do we need? What actions do we need? And how do we uh, both mobilize and resource that? Because part of WHO's problems, and I saw this very much firsthand during my time as uh, representative, is that uh, with the best of intentions, there's a whole lot they just cannot do because they don't have the money. Mm. So uh, you have to build, on the one side, the uh, credibility of WHO, rebuild it. And on the other side, you've got to fund that credibility because um, it's, not, it's not a simple or cheap thing. Uh, and WHO is uh, woefully under-resourced. Yeah. Okay. That's very helpful. Last kind of question, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, one of the points that you've made and uh, over and over again is this notion of interconnectedness and the sense of um, we can't solve these issues by looking either by building walls or by thinking that the problems are only out there. Mm -hmm. and. Um, are you optimistic that, that senior U.S. policymakers kind of understand this new worldview, this sense of global is truly global, it's not international, it includes us too, and we have to engage it. Engage it. I'm not asking, does everybody in Washington understand that? But are you optimistic that, that the U.S. sort of um, government, the, the policymakers, um, fundamentally get this and are heading in the right direction, even if you have to pull some people along? Ask me that question in 51 weeks. Um, <laughs> right, right now, I would say the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, I think there has been uh, enormous recognition of uh, these challenges and these issues, and uh, I think we are very much on the right path, but we are a representative democracy, and yes. uh, the person who sits at the top will have enormous influence in terms of how these things are uh, are addressed moving forward. Um, so uh, again, I'm optimistic, but uh, yeah, yeah. we'll we'll have to see what uh, what the voters say. Great. And so now, uh, as we finish, I want you to, um, if you don't mind, project out over the next five, ten years, um, and thinking about uh, America's role in global health. Um, and again, without getting into a whole lot of specifics, should we do X more or Y more? Do you see us more engaged, more involved, um, playing a more um, effective and constructive role? Or to, do you worry about pulling back? And we've, again, we've seen some of those strands of people saying, we should, we gotta build here, we gotta, um, overall, on this kind of broad arc of, of, of this topic, are you optimistic that, that we're gonna be more engaged and more involved on these issues uh, over the next five, 10 years? Let me take that from both sides, yeah. both from our domestic side and from the global perspective. Yeah. Uh, from the global perspective, uh, I think other countries, almost without exception, see the importance of U.S. engagement and leadership. And uh, one of the very heartening things of my time at WHO and in the international arena was how interested people were in what was going on here, healthcare reform, uh, our national leadership, and how important it was in terms of setting a tone uh, and setting the, the terms of the discussion. So I think that's very uh, important. I think on the flip side, again, we do have our, our political uh, vicissitudes, but I think ultimately um, the weight of history uh, f will force our leadership uh, to be actively engaged. Some, some will do it with great gusto and, and, uh, and voluntarily, and others will be dragged kicking and screaming into it. Depends on who's where at the time. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that, that any of them are gonna be able to say, no, we're not gonna deal with those issues because they're somebody else's issues. Uh, the realities on the ground uh, will override all those things. And uh, we can either prepare and do it thoughtfully, or we can react and probably spend a lot more money on it than we need to. Wow. Um, with that, I, I, I want to thank you. you know, I'm, I'm reminded, as you started us off talking about what is global health, I'm reminded of a line that Julio Frank, uh, our former dean, often used, which was, he said, uh, you know, the, the longest incubation period for, sorry, the shortest incubation period uh, for a, a, every known human pathogen is uh, 
is longer than the, sorry, I'm not getting this right. Let me try it one more time. Yeah. The, uh, the incubation period of every known human pathogen is uh, longer than the longest human flight that exists, right? Mm -hmm. So there is no virus, no disease that can't spread from any one part of the world to another. Yeah. And that means that building walls and thinking that we can keep all this stuff out or thinking that global health is out there is a fool's errand. Absolutely. And I, my sense is that, that since then, the realization of interconnectedness is, was what is really driving so much of the passion mm. um, that I think a lot of us feel about global health. Um, but how you turn that passion into effectiveness, I think you have been the uh, model of that. So thank you for all that you've done for global health. Uh, thank you for spending time at the school, and, and a big thanks for spending time with us today. Thank you.